Yo, this is Pete Town's finest, representing the NEP, D. Stoudemire, and y'all know what we're talking about. No one's ready to deal with us. This is CJ McCollum of your Portland Trailblazers. You're listening to the Rip City Report with Casey Holdoff and Joe Freeman. Yeah, I've never heard of these guys either. Hello, boys and girls, and welcome to another edition of the Rip City Report. I am Joe Freeman of the Oregonian. He is Casey Holdall of Trailblazers.com. Greetings, Joe. What's Hello. up, man? Not much. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Yeah, you living look good. large. You so do you. Yeah, looking nice. You got a nice new sweatshirt, new sweater. sweater kind yeah, of thing Joe's on? got a nice hat. He actually wore for the last podcast, but I did. It's still a nice hat. So yeah, shout out to Graphletics. Great hey. little spot. I, I like it. Great guy he owns it. Uh, they've uh, you guys have probably heard of them. They've been around for a while, but they have a little shop over in Selwood now. They it's do. A, it's a great store. A great dude. I recommend you guys checking out their stuff. This is some uh, great free promotion. You're, You're welcome out here, Joe. You're welcome. Yeah. So it helps support local back, business. Come back around to the uh, to the podcast crew. Yeah, our our, our uh, cast of hundreds here that put together the podcast. Yes, our many many producers, yeah, exactly and producers, executive producers, grips, keys, gaffers. And when one of us isn't feeling well, we have a stand-in, a yeah. fill-in. A body will come in and take our place. You yeah. don't even know. It's it's the same. It's like a robot version of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they just walk in after you know dropping off the traffic reports for a. Uh, for the radio for that <laughs> night, so it's coming in and out anytime they please. Yeah. Well, thanks as always for joining us. Um, got a good. Uh, the Blazers are winning again. Yeah, you guys are probably all happy. Well, I, I think it's mixed. We That's can talk true. About that. Yeah. That's true. Actually, you're right. It is mixed. Unfortunately. Well, no. I'm, well, not unfortunately, but I mean, I think in general, you know, I, I think it's people root for a team because they want to see them win and Mm -hmm. you know obviously situations being as they are and draft picks and so on and so forth you know there's a there's definitely a contingent out there that's I hope they're at least enjoying the games because yeah. they, they've been some fun basketball to watch lately, particularly the game uh, versus Oklahoma City that they won in Oklahoma City. Um, but, you know, I as I mentioned on last week's podcast, I, I'm perfectly fine with people rooting. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think however you want to, whatever you're pulling for is fine. You're right as a fan. Yeah. You can root or not root or kind of root and as as to your heart chooses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you do what you do. Yeah. I, I, I do question how healthy it is to as a fan to root for losses, but, you know. It's not for long, I don't think. So, uh, Speaking of healthy, uh, if I ever have a conversation with the person, it will not be healthy. Let me state that before I get into what I'm going to talk about. As dog owners, I urge you, and I'm sure <laughs> all of our wonderful Rip City Report listeners like are, are wonderful uh, Samaritans in their neighborhoods and, and with their fellow uh, Americans around them, please clean up after your dog. Like, yeah, no, please that's don't trash. leave mammoth mounds of dog poop in people's lawns. Like, you live with these people, right? I mean, like, you have to see them. And also, like, just be a good human and a good pet owner. You, you're staining the reputations of all pet owners by doing that. And we've got young children who are playing out in the yard, and maybe they'll start playing in it and eating it who knows but like uh, yeah Before no we 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 here in portland give people who bring their dogs and other animals i guess everywhere we, we give them a pretty wide berth yeah, you know like a good for the place most part, to be a dog allow, like people bring their dogs to restaurants you think it's kind of weird but you know whatever uh, people bring their dogs places where in any other city you would not bring your dog and you know you might get an eyebrow raised here or there but for the most part i let it slide but yeah but the, but the the implicit contract there is that you pick up for that dog it's a social responsibility you, you, you cannot leave anything anywhere that as a dog as if i don't own a dog right now but as a longtime dog owner um yeah no that's it's unacceptable there's nothing worse than getting a text in the morning just after you uh or it was before i woke i don't remember but uh from a neighbor neighbor dave in this case saying uh that mound of poop is so huge that you know it's not from my dog pepper basically <laughs> saying it wasn't me at, it was, at at the school by my house um it's a large they have a large fenced in grass play area which when we first moved to the neighborhood people used to use as a dog park all the time so you know we would take our dogs there at, um, you know after work and there would probably be up to 30 yeah people with their dogs there 
But then the school was leaving notes. They're like, hey, guys, um, you got to pick up your dog poop yeah. here. Like, we have kids that are out here playing. Right. Like, they come in from, from recess after lunch, and they've got dog crap all over themselves. Gross. Uh, so if you guys could, you know, be cool and actually pick up the droppings, that would be great. And then people still didn't do it, and the school's like, you know what? To hell with this. Don't bring your dogs here anymore, which is a perfectly reasonable response for them to have. There's a special place in the afterlife for people who do that. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, so he's Casey Holdall. His Twitter handle, please give him a follow. It is at C Hold. And uh, my Twitter is at Blazer Freeman. It's a good way to not only communicate with us, but to participate in the show because we do solicit questions from you guys. And that's kind of our main way to do that. And uh, we got some good questions this show as yeah, we do. Yeah, we shows. did. Um, and of course, you can, and please do, access our. Uh, work that we work so very hard on you can check out Casey's stuff at blazers.com slash forward center and you can access mine and my colleagues stuff at organlive.com slash blazers and if you follow the podcast subscribe to it on iTunes give us a review we like to uh, hear what you think about the show and uh, we like all the stars so give us all the stars that yeah. you have um, and for that matter not just iTunes wherever Stitcher wherever or it is, YouTube yeah. or wherever if you, you could, if you can, you can leave a note somewhere you leave it we'll read it Please do. Um, all right, let's get into news and notes. The Blazers defeated the Oklahoma City Thunder. I don't think it was 161 to 121. I bet that's a typo. Who did? My, my own typo oh, and okay. my own notes. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I got nervous there for a second. I, I was like, oh, that's geez, accurate. Joe, I'm sorry. I don't think that's accurate. Yeah, according to... Uh well, never mind. You just keep talking. The Blazers won. They beat the Thunder <laughs> probably 124 to 121. 126, 121. There you go. 126 to 121 Tuesday night on the road. Uh, it was their third consecutive win. It was their uh, first. And Oklahoma City's fourth consecutive loss, by the way. Right. Yeah. They just lost that, the, all three games on that trip, mm -hmm. starting with that loss at Portland. That's right. Um, Bookends. So it was the Blazers' first three-game winning streak since late January and actually equals their longest winning streak of the season. You have the 76ers coming into town uh, on Thursday, which perhaps they could win their fourth in a row. Perhaps they could. That 76er team, I mean, granted, they're, Little they're not even now. the same 76er team that the Blazers lost to in Philadelphia. Uh, and they always give, to give Portland a good game. So yeah. that that's that's no rollover. And just the, the point of this season, the the... One, I, I think, takeaway from this entire from this team, there's a lot of mystery around it. No one knows why they aren't as good as they were last year. Or people have theories, but no one can put their finger <laughs> on it. Exactly. The one thing you can say about this team is that they are not good enough to beat any team in the NBA yeah. if they don't come out and play well. Period. As, as so. Damian Lillard always says, yeah, and, and they know that yeah. too. They don't play like it sometimes. I feel like true, but. I I, th I think they know that that there there's no team that comes into the Moda Center, and there's certainly no place they go in the NBA on the road where they can just walk in, roll the ball on the court, and feel like they're going to win that game because they'll get blown out. Totally. Um, so when the Blazers traded Mason Plumley for Yusuf Nurkic, it didn't just resurrect their season; it made them the youngest team in the NBA with an average age of 24 years and 363 days. The Blazers roster is younger than the. Philadelphia 76ers 25.096 and the Philadelphia or excuse me the Phoenix Suns 25.218 so how about that yeah how about that and then uh, we have a few injury updates here slash surgery updates Ed Davis and Festus Azili have had their surgeries over the last couple of days and of, co of course they were deemed quote unquote successful both are done for the season Davis is expected to be healed by training camp uh, and then in other injury news, Evan Turner is inching closer to a return. He had the cast on his right hand removed on Friday. Now is down to a splint, and he says he's on track to return by March 15th, just right in that schedule that was given when he originally fractured the third metacarpal in his right hand. Sounds like he's really itching for a return sooner than later, but doctors are kind of giving him justifiable caution. He says his bone is, is still a little soft is kind of what the deal is. So they're waiting for that to harden. And then he said it would be about a week or more before he could grip or dribble a basketball with that hand. So uh, he's getting closer and closer. Yeah. And the thing is, too, you got to take your time with that. You know, like you, you blow five weeks if you come back and, you know, get a hairline fracture in it two days. You're done for the season. Earlier, so, yeah. Uh, boy, how about uh, um, Andrew Bogut playing two minutes for the <laughs> Cavs and then breaking his leg? Yeah. Boy, how about a, that? I yeah, mean, I, yeah, I mean that, that stinks for him and it stinks for the Cavs. On the other hand, too, and I mentioned this, I, I think the NBA should at least consider doing something about post-trade deadline 
waiver yes. signings because it seems like it's getting it seems to me like it's getting a little out of hand with guys particularly in the last years of their enormous contracts who are still fairly decent players getting waived by their teams and then latching on with you know either the Warriors or the Cavaliers for the remainder of the season now granted in this case it didn't work out so well for the Cavaliers seeing as how Bogut broke his leg two minutes into his run this season but it just I don't know I I, I think it it comes off as just a little I feel like it's just kind of bad for the league a little bit. And two, like people complain about the trade deadline not being exciting enough. It's like, well, hey, if teams actually had to trade players rather than just knowing they could pick up guys off of waivers, you might see some actual deals take place. So yeah. I don't I don't know what the answer is and I don't I don't particularly like the idea of further restricting player movement, but it just seems like you know, just this constant event every single year where like whatever the two or three top teams are signing whatever players just got waived from teams that in theory they still have value for to me it just i don't know it, it seems like there's something to do maybe something to to address i want to like say that. major league baseball uh once you pass the trade deadline you can still acquire guys off waivers they're just un, they're not eligible for the playoffs sure which i mean in the nba it would be completely yeah worthless yeah know? and I, I think someone even mentioned you know like just moving up the the dates for when you can when you are on the playoff roster maybe up until you know a couple days behind the trade deadline so uh you know it makes and and also for teams that have injuries it's understandable and Mm -hmm. i think they're that that is helpful if you have a late season injury it's like we can go and get a guy who maybe our entire season won't be screwed because you know we just lost this guy 20 games before the end of the season but again like this notion of guys like latching on to championship caliber teams you know at the last minute I don't. I don't know. It just how about it just doesn't uh, feel right. Jose Calderon thinking he's yeah. latching on for a ring, and then <laughs> boop. Sorry, dude. Yeah, I mean he he. What did he pull down for? Literally, like being a warrior for. I think I I think he got like over two hundred thousand for basically signing and then getting waived for almost having a uniform. Yeah. For kind of having a uniform, which I mean, I bet he was kind of bummed out. You know, oh, I mean, for like sure. he's, get, I guess he's getting the money either way. Yeah. So, so I don't yeah, think, you want to? I mean, that's cli- this is cliche, but I don't think that was a money thing for him. I nah. think it was a, yeah. a ring chasing thing yeah. for him, and probably to be a part of that organization, which yeah. seems like a pretty fun organization to work for. So now they so they go get Matt Barnes instead. Not that perfect. Oh Matt my Barnes, God. such a Matt Barnes, the bad boy of karate boy. <laughs> it's from Karate Kid Three. I'd say that I think every single time that I mention the name Matt Barnes. He was the villain in Karate Kid 3. Yeah. Uh, okay. Finally, last news and note, a look at the rest of the week. The Blazers host the Philadelphia 76ers on Thursday night and then the Washington Wizards on Saturday night before leaving for a five-game, eight-day trip. You ready for that one, Casey? Not yet, but I'm uh, I'm getting I'm, I'm getting ready. I mean, because that trip, too, that's the last trip. Mm-hmm. So, like, you get through that trip or even when you're in that trip, you're like, boy, we're close. Oh. We, are, we are there. We're we're knocking on the door, mm-hmm. um, so so no, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it, and it it'll, you know, that trip in in some well, I guess something can't be in some ways make or break because if it's make or break, it is or it isn't. <laughs> but that trip, it's obviously on the road, but there are a few winnable games, not not a ton. So um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that trip plays out and where they're at in terms of playoff positioning by that point yeah we were talking about this the other day uh my colleague mike richmond and i with someone asked us when when it was going to officially be over for this team and this was before i think they had they had gone on this little mini run and mike said during that trip was when he in the middle of that trip he thought it would probably be a nail in the coffin time but all of a sudden yusuf nurkic is a legend the man the myth the legend it's changed everything the blazers have won three in a row and everything is uh hunky dory or at least sort of positive around here now before we get into that and more we wanted to give you a uh we figured we probably might as well do this every podcast give you a quick update on your future first round picks yeah. if we had some kind of noise we could do some kind of little uh sound effect there i don't know what a ball hopper so well it's not really lottery anyway so i guess a ball hopper wouldn't be yeah apropos. it would make your brain think of it though you know what i mean yeah i guess that's true I, I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be like a literal connection I would say it could be like David Stern saying, and with the 21st pick, but he doesn't even do that anymore. Uh, Anyway, where we're at right now on March 8th is the Cleveland Cavaliers are in 26th. Well, excuse me. The Cleveland Cavaliers pick would be the 26th pick for Mm -hmm. the Blazers, and the Memphis Grizzlies pick would be the 21st pick. So looking at a couple late 10, bottom third of the draft picks, plus your own pick. Plus Portland's pick. Wherever 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 that ends up. 
So I don't even know where to begin. How about that postponement in Minnesota? Yeah, how about that? Yeah, so obviously team flies to Minnesota a day early as per NBA rules, arrives in, uh, at the Target Center, and uh, I guess because of Disney on ice the night before, uh, they couldn't get the condensation under control, and because of the temperature in the Exceedingly arena. Exceedingly high temperature. Um, and yeah, they had to call the game, which uh, this is the second time... You know, in in the season that they've had to call a Blazer game, which no, 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 oh yeah, 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 and I don't, I don't recall that. Well, no, so it happened in Brooklyn uh, two season or three seasons ago. Two now. seasons ago. Um, but other than that, as long as I had been with the team, I don't recall a game ever being postponed. And now we've had two in one season. It's kind of crazy. Which I I mentioned this on our when we were flying when we landed after not the the road trip that guests came back from. Which by the way, neither Joe or, or I went to. Way to go, Joe and uh, Cody. Uh, Mike, Mike, yeah, Joe, yeah, that's right. You're Joe. Um, <laughs> so we get back from the trip, and you know it was a long flight from where was that we were coming from? Just now? Yeah. Well, not Oklahoma just now. City. No, 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 no. The the trip before that. Oh, Detroit. Detroit. Thank you. So, long flight back from Detroit. We land, and uh, they can't get the door open for the... We usually enter from the the middle of the plane, and obviously there's a door in the rear and a door in the back, but mm-hmm. they bring this, this sky bridge thing to the one in the middle. Uh, so, we're sitting on the tarmac, and they we're sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, and they can't get it open. So, eventually, they have to go to a different door, which is no big deal, but it was just like... There's just been a bunch of little things this year where it's like just little small... I don't even know if I'd call them annoyances, but just like travel issues. Usually things, but not even just travel issues, though, just like bumps, you know, like just little things that kind of trip you up just a little bit that, and, and things that had never happened before. So, you know, you got, I mean, from having to fly to Seattle after, for the snow to uh, in Orlando, our plane, our, the plane we were supposed to take from Orlando to Toronto uh, had a malfunction, so we had to wait to get a different plane. Like, there's just been a whole lot of just, just small things that have happened this year that it's just like it's just bad luck you know and it's not and it, to me it just seems like kind of the season in general where Fitting it's like every the time season. they kind of feel like they get going maybe just a little bit like bam they trip again and and fall flat and it's just the whole season from again from like the play on the court to kind of all of the the logistics about how we get around it's just just little just little trip ups here and there. I was really hoping that this story was going in another direction. <laughs> I had this visual of like the big, huge, like blow up uh, ramps being emergency ramps being uh, blown up outside of your guys' plane, and you popping out the door, and all of these gigantic humans jumping. There out was on talk this about ramp. that. Yeah. I mean, I'm standing there, and I'm like, what? What's the holdup? And you know, we they treat us very well, but again, like you're at the end of a road trip. You've been gone for eight days. You just got done with a six-hour flight, and you, you were know, in Detroit, just, you, and you know it, it's two o'clock in the morning. You want to get home, and you know the door won't open. And again, it's like it's not a big deal, but it's again just like little the little things, just yeah. little annoyances. And and there was definitely talk about popping that that door open too. Like once I started grousing in the back of the plane, everyone else is like, "Yeah, what's what's going on here?" And then you can see <laughs> up front of the plane, like the players are all just milling around. And you're like, "What's something's not right here? We should." We should all be home by now. Now, I bet that's a rarity for you when you start grousing and you hear people say, yeah, that's right, in the oh, back no, of the I, 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 You elicit a lot I, of I, I can, I can rally the masses. Rally a, a, a rabble, yeah. No, <laughs> I, my powers of persuasion, particularly when, when it's something negative that I'm mad about, is uh, I think it's pretty good. All right, fair enough. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think we can get through a podcast anymore without talking about the man, the myth, the legend now. Yeah. I mean, Yusuf Nurkic has taken on a... a I don't even know a legend of his own. It's watching that game last night. You're just like this guy's insane. Dude, so my, that scoop shot at the end, I was like, forget it. Yeah. Not even that, but like, forget it. Some of his passes in the first half, and there was that fast break run he had mm-hmm. where he. I was like, is he that fast? He like got ahead for the for the break, and I'm like, first of all, how the hell does this guy get benched in Denver? I don't care about the incredible other guy you have. Find a way to make these guys work. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, there a lot of it'll, what you hear from people in Denver is that it was an attitude issue, which, yeah. you know, I mean, young players are kind of prone to that. But still, like, you got to – I don't know. I, I don't 
You can't speak. I, I, yeah, yeah. I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, who knows what's going on behind the scenes there? More importantly for the here and now is what he's done for the Blazers. And, you know, what I sort of noticed early on, and I think I wrote about this over the weekend or a couple games ago, is that uh, in a way this team was had become very boring and yeah. very predictable and very, like, flat. Like, it was just very flat. Yeah. Every every player was flat. The whole organization was flat. Um and he really just gave them like a boost, like this emotional boost of this newness, this new energy, this new games, the skills, this new talent, this new facet. And really, it seems to me that everybody's kind of fed off that. Yeah. Um, and that accompanied with just that he's been incredible. Uh, if you look at his first of all, he's played seven games. The Blazers are four and three. Uh, in those games, and that includes him going out in no kind of shape in that first game at Utah before the break. So when you look at it after that, they're what four and two, I guess. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he's averaged fourteen point nine points, eight point one rebounds, four assists, one point six steals, and one point three blocks. Because he's really doing a little bit of everything, shooting fifty five percent. We've talked about uh, in previous podcasts what he does, uh, the new dimension that he provides, and every the, everything that he seems to to be, but. Every game, he keeps doing a little more or, or being a little more impressive. And you keep waiting for it to go, s- not south, but to, to even out, sure. I guess, so to speak, or him to revert back to the mean. And it, it really isn't happening. No, I mean, I, I think they're they're getting that bounce that I feel like a lot of teams get sometimes, you know, when they fire a coach. But it, it has been more right. extended, you right, know. Right. And and I, I think you're right about the mentality, too, Joe. To me... I, I got the sense from this team before the Nurkic trade, it was just like an acceptance of, you know, this is who we are. You know, like we're just not very good. Mm-hmm. Like, and we're going to keep trying and we're not giving up and we're saying the right things. But I think in their heart of hearts, they're like, yep, this this is the team we are. We're we're not a very good team. Mm-hmm. And that's that. And then, you know, you have a you have someone like Nurkic come in and, and it just kind of changes that that question. You know, it goes from this is who we are to well maybe maybe we could be better with it with with this other facet of skills that we didn't have before Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think you're seeing that and I mean from you know from the way that he passes to to you mentioning Joe running the floor to having a post presence I thought for sure that that when he was in the block late in the game last night that Russell Westbrook was going to flop he didn't Nurkic went around and scored easily over the top of him after getting called for an offensive foul I think a play or two before on on uh, Taj Gibson so which yeah, was a it, good call, by the way. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. I, when I was watching, I was like, yeah, that's yeah. that's a fair call. My I only figured. question was if he was in the cylinder or not. He, he, he definitely. Wasn't. I mean, he was he, he was a ways away from it. I, the I mean, I don't love that call for any team, but I mean, if if that's the rule, perfectly fair call. Uh, and yeah, it just seems like they they feel like, hey, maybe maybe we're not as bad as we've been showing all year long. And granted, I think that adding Nurkic changes the. The look of this team significantly, obviously, but I, I also think that maybe some of the guys who thought they were going to have better seasons um, have maybe perked up a bit and said, "Yeah, you know, maybe maybe we can be better than this." I mean, I, I think Alfred Camino has been fantastic. I think Mo has been really good. Uh, Myers, the past couple games, been playing really well. Uh, Damian's been that up. Damian has, has been fantastic, um, and and AC. I mean, hell, you know, we haven't even mentioned Alan Crabb yet, and he's been playing really well. So. Uh, you know, it just seems like they are starting to to peak a little bit. I'm not saying they're gonna they're building anything at this point because again, I've been fooled before. I, I'm I'm not going there anymore. Yeah. Like they they're not gonna get that for me. And truth be told, they don't need it. But <laughs> I, I I do think that there are reasons to to feel good about where this team is right now and going forward too. I mean, if you if you were one of the 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 folks who kind of saw the signings this off season saw the way the play team played this year. And we're like, Oh man, like what's, what's the hope? Like, where can we, are, is this it? Like, are we stuck here? I think with Nurkic, I think you're probably feeling a lot better about where the team is going from here. Yeah. Well. When you look at him, he's clearly a guy who's been liberated by the move and, yeah. uh, and he's having fun. Mm-hmm. And it looks like his teammates are too. Like, it's just, again, like there was, like you said, the players said all the right things. And, you know, I think there was a part of them that knew that they could go into every game and winning. But despite their talent and all that blah, 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 blah stuff, they were losing. And, but 
just one an adjustment like this with a guy with a different who's fresh who doesn't know anybody who continuously says I just want to win I don't care I'm happy to play blah 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 uh, that's two blah blah blahs your stepdad's going to be very upset about that yeah I don't know if he's listening anymore but oh. he 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 told me uh, after I can't remember which loss it was that he, he was done with the team okay he, he's done with us for the year though he did call last night I didn't take the call I was almost going to take and be like Jim you. You can't jump back on that. You gotta wait for next year now. You your office. <laughs> Whatever. The bandwagon's always open for anybody. So he did yeah. come to a game with my wife and my sister in law the okay. other day and they had a good time. So maybe the, maybe being in the Moda Center reinvigorated yeah. his uh, his, his desire to okay. work for the team. But anyway, it just looks like the team is having more fun. And obviously winning does that. But even before I mean, they're four and three with him. So they've still lost, you know, a couple games, obviously. He, there was a different vibe then too and I don't think it's just him because as you just mentioned all the other players Al Farouk Aminu finally looks healthy mm -hmm. and he obviously has been very very good lately um, and it's crazy to me that he's I mean can we talk about why he's not starting What? why is he not in the starting lineup your best lineup right now is Dame, CJ, Mo, Aminu and Nurk like that's your best five I think it's because he's played so well off the bench, you know, I, and I obviously they like that lineup because it's the lineup it's closing they, lineup. They, they close with. It's the lineup they wanted to play with all season and, and injury. Well, obviously with Plumlee and for Nurkic at the time, but I just think he's I feel like they're at the point where like he's playing so well off the bench. Why mess he, with it? Yeah, exactly. And he, he just seems like he's a little more live when he's coming off the bench. Like it seems I, again, I think that maybe. Splitting up some of those minutes with with Dame and and CJ and and getting him, you know, on the floor where maybe he's you know the second or third option rather than the fourth or fifth option. I, I think there's there's maybe something to that in regards to why he has played better along with with probably feeling healthier. But I mean, I I, I think it's I I think basically to answer your question right now, Joe, it's because they don't want to tinker with it right now because Evan Turner's going to be coming back here before too awful long, and then. Who knows? Who knows what happens at that point? So. We actually do have a couple questions about Evan Turner. Um, I don't know if we want to get into them right now. I could dig in and find them, or we could just hold them. Nah, let's hold off. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one thing I do wonder about, because look, in the grand scheme of things, this is a three-game stretch out of 82. It, it's not, yes. it's not a big a deal. Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's a nice, small, uh, you know, run. The question is, is it going to continue? And, and even more... You know, is it is it reflective of something bigger to come? And has it, I guess, has it changed the way you think about this team moving forward? Has it changed your outlook on this team moving forward? I know it was either last week or two weeks ago. I essentially said that I'm done. You know, this team's not making the playoffs. I finally reached that point. Um, but has it? I wonder. Has it made myself rethink that? I don't, you, yeah. How I, do you feel about? It? Where do you fall? I mean, I that? think you. I think you probably feel. A little better. If you if you want them to make the playoffs this year, I think you feel obviously let's, better. Let's let's go with the assumption that uh, the non tankers. That if you're a guy who's rooting or a, or a girl who's rooting for a playoff berth, how has it changed? Has it changed? Do you think that that? Yes, I, I think the for the the playoff people. I think well, and I guess also for the tankers, but just obviously in the opposite direction. Right. Yeah, and I, I believe it has changed because I think. I see the way you see the way that Nurkic has played, and, and again the, the the different look that he gives his team. And I think after you know six or seven games, I, I think it's I don't think you need to worry about necessarily at this point that like well they're going to scout something that's going to take away what Nurkic does. Now, granted, teams will get better at dealing with him, particularly I think him and Damian in the pick and roll. But I, I think you're you're about to the point where you're seeing enough to say, yeah, this is this is at least how well this guy's going to play for the rest of the season. And, and I think, again, as in the more long view, you were probably wondering, you know, who's who's the guy that – who's the third guy on this team? You know, and I, and I think that people have, at times have hoped it was going to be Alan Crabb. I think some people hoped it would be Evan Turner. And Mo. who knows, maybe it will be. I think Mo as well. But I, now I, I think you – I think you feel probably pretty strongly, particularly since your two best players are guards, that your next guy being a center makes a lot of sense. And I think you're seeing kind of the result of that, which is if you have a center who is more adept at scoring, particularly in a fashion near the basket, that that fits in well with the things that you, that this team already 
already does well, which is score from the perimeter. So, yeah, and uh, a couple things about him too. Uh, the dude is only twenty two, and he's young, yeah. and and he only started playing basketball at age fourteen. So, like, what you're seeing, and and it's the cliche, the Myers Leonard typical big thing is it takes longer for bigs to develop and all that and this is already what he's shown at 22 after what was you know a couple years ago a pretty good rookie season it really does if I were a Blazers fan I would be over the moon about what this guy can potentially do for your franchise for a franchise that has been searching for a center for ever to have this guy fall into your lap uh for and a, to, to come with a first round pick, it's pretty incredible, actually. Um, and just goes to show that sometimes guys get out of one situation that isn't good for them and get into another, and it's great. Absolutely, and it, which and it, again, it's why like at I don't understand why there's always this rush to decide who a player is when he's you know twenty one, twenty two years old. And I mean, we all do it from time to time, but like, there's just it's foolish. Players can get better. You know, yeah. and and some situations just aren't good for players, and that's not even a knock on the situation. You know, like sometimes it's just not a good fit. Um, yeah, sometimes people are in jobs that they don't like, and it's a good job or whatever, but it's just not for them. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, no, I mean it, it's it, it makes sense. You know, and I I would say that getting the first round draft pick that I feel like is a that that go <laughs> that's a a level of value getting in that trade that I, I think is it's wild considering how well Nurkic has yeah. played. Um what was I gonna say? I just lost my train of thought. That's okay, Joe. Yeah. You do wonder uh we're seven games in. It yeah. was like going with a three game winning streak. Like it's not a large enough sample size to make, you know some of these questions we have. I joked around after the first podcast we did after Nurkic arrived and you know said something to the effect is is he the second coming of Sabonis and Odin and all this put together. We actually have some joking questions that are on that line. It's way too early to really know who this guy is going to be for this franchise, but early indications are good. You do wonder, like, he definitely um, gets a little too aggressive sometimes, and, and like you talked about the, the drawing of the charge. Like, he'll try to do too much from time to time, but you'd rather a guy with his skill set do that than be the other way. And um, you thought that you were losing a lot of playmaking and passing when you got rid of Plumley, but it turns out... Maybe not, because yeah. his passing really is the thing that has surprised me the most. He had a – it was late in the game. I think it was late in the game. Yeah, and he had a double, a fake handoff, a two-fake handoff or something around the free throw line, and then he passed a, for a layup underneath the hoop. Uh, I think it was to Mo. Just a beautiful play. And early in the first quarter, he had that pass to someone for a dunk. I think it was Noah or maybe it was Mo. Just uh, – I don't know. I did not expect that type of ball skills from him, um, from a guy as huge he is, uh, you know, who wasn't really touted as that mm-hmm. kind of a player. He's and not the playmaker that Mason Plumley is. For sure. I, I'm for not sure. going to go there. For sure. He is a as good of a passer, actually arguably a better passer, to be perfectly frank. Uh, but, I mean, Plumley, yeah, yeah, actually, Plumley was kind of directing directed sure. traffic. And, I mean, maybe Nurkic can get to that point, but um, – I don't know that that'll necessarily be in his wheelhouse, but you also don't need him to necessarily. I mean, if you can dump the ball down to him, that's that's all you need. Yeah, like that. That's your play. Like that's the, that is freeing things up for the other guys on the team. And I mean, I, I think that you know, you talk about Al Farouk Aminu shooting, AC shooting, even Mo shooting to a certain extent. I mean, I, I think that the the attention that Nurkic draws in the post is is having benefits for those guys. Whereas with Plumlee, you know, you. You could sag off of him in the post because you you knew that he probably he was no wasn't going to be a, a, a post threat with Nurkic. You, the, the defenders have to have to to play him there, and in some respects, he he might at some point draw doubles here and there. As he as did teams, get one on the baseline, yeah, late he did last exactly. Night, yeah. That's exactly why I mentioned it. So, uh, you know that has benefits for all four guys that are on the on the floor with you at that time. So also, I mean, you mentioned the pick and roll. When has Damian Lillard had a guy who actually rolls? LA's a pick and pop guy. I mean, Myers is a pick and pop guy. Yeah. Uh, Mason, I guess he was a pick and pop. I mean, I mean he was roll sometimes, but not but like, I mean, and, and and really rolling kind of with 
looking to to dish, right? You know, like not looking so much to to score. So, but a legitimate guy where you'll see Dame in a pick and roll, and and then when you talked about defenses are going to start countering that, well, okay, then you're creating more space for Dame on the perimeter, like to have that threat in in the pick and roll that rolls, and then also a guy who who commands attention down low it really you can't stress and we have stressed enough but you can't stress enough what that does for a team adding that that dimension so um and meanwhile here we are what are we? we've got 20 games left yes i believe it is 20 games playoff and race, nice, nice round yeah 20 games left blazers are in ninth place in the western conference at 27 and 35 <laughs> why that is that's not it's crazy <laughs> that that's in ninth place uh and they are a mere game and a half behind your denver nuggets who are 29 and 34 so it's right there for the taking if they want it Mavs suddenly in in tenth. The Mavs are are surging. I mean, the 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 Mavs have gotten a boost from getting rid of Darren Williams. Like the Blazers have gotten a boost from from bringing in Yusuf Nurkic. Right. Well, and I obviously, I guess bringing Nerlens Noel has probably had something to do with it as well. Too, yeah. Playing well, though he's, yeah. he missed a f- he was late for a flight. He was supposed. I think it was like a week ago. He was supposed to start, but he was late for the team plane. So Ooh. they didn't start him, which is yeah. that's a Rick Carlisle not not a, not a good way to start off your uh, your your tenure with the team. You no. don't be late, kids. No, uh, the Blazers. I think because of the Minnesota snafu, now still have three meetings against the Timberwolves, who are in eleventh place and sort of uh, were playing pretty well. And then one game against the Nuggets, I believe, still upcoming. But their schedule is very very kind down the stretch. They have I believe the easiest schedule of the teams they're kind of competing with for that 8th spot. And uh, I want to say 12 of their final 20 games are at home. Yeah. Something like that. Including 10 of their last 12. When we get back from that 5 game trip uh, east in I guess it'll be a week and a half now. It's smooth sailing from a home standpoint. There's just two. Well, now there's three, I guess, because of that Minnesota yeah. game. And, and you know, and that's part of it as well. And it should not go unmentioned that the Blazers' schedule is is lightening up. You know, that by some measures, they have the easiest schedule to close out the the season, particularly of the teams that are fighting for that for that eight spot. So, while they are playing better basketball, it does need to be noted that they're they're playing some easier competition. And as you just mentioned, Joe, I mean, they're going to get a lot of home games as well. So. So that that's worth considering. Though when the team is playing poorly, no one says, "Well, their schedule is hard right now, so cut them a break." You know. So in that regard, I, I don't know if you can just point to the schedule and say, "Well, yeah, of course they're doing better. The schedule is easier," um, because again, you don't you don't get that same concession when when you're playing poorly. Should and the get, schedule is the schedule. You play you play the games that are on yeah, your schedule you where play, they tell you to play. Everybody, and, plays unless the same you're you're Minnesota. Which, by the way, too, as uh, I was talking about this before, in terms of that makeup game, which has not been announced yet. I personally think the Blazers should get to decide where that game is played. They showed up on time. They followed the NBA rules. They arrived at the arena. The Timberwolves, who are responsible for the court, did not have it ready to play, which is understandable. It, it, somewhat out of their control. But the fact of the matter is that that's their gym, and, and they're supposed to provide the, the environment for that night. So why should the Blazers have to have an extra trip when it wasn't their fault and it wasn't, you know force majeure as in it wasn't because of a weather event it wasn't an act of god so how come the blazers are the ones that get punished there and that's really what it is i mean they're the ones that get punished so they should at least have the option of saying you know we want to have this game at home and if they can't find a date or don't want it they say yeah okay we'll we'll let minnesota host it but i think they should get that they should have the right of first refusal there i just wanted to mention that well Let's piggyback on that and let's get to questions, shall we? Yeah, let's do questions. And then so this there was a question we got from Greg Brock who says, do you think the Minnesota reschedule will help or hurt the team? And I think it's 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 both. It's in the here and now it helps them. They, yeah, because they they had a night off before Absolutely. playing the Thunder, which, which and I even thought too. I thought late in the third quarter of that game, I thought they looked tired. Mm-hmm. Like and I and I thought they were gonna it was gonna kind of get away from them because. It looked like they were they were gassed, and that's when I thought too. I was like, "Boy, if they had played last night, they'd be done." This looks a whole lot different, even as it is right now. They look like they're, you know, they're they're struggling to get to the end of the quarter. Uh, and yeah, I guess in that regard, you can't really complain about the the postponement all that much because it definitely did help. You're right, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, our good friend Kevin Calabro and and Lamar Heard were talking about this briefly on the broadcast last night, and Kevin said something to the effect of, "You know, the the I don't know the." 
the issues they had last night, you know, kind of persevering through that in this win. And I was like, mentally, I was like, I don't know about, I think that last night helped them getting out of that game. Cause you don't want to play at the thunder on the second game of a back to back against uh freaking Russell Westbrook. Yeah. I mean, that's, bananas. that's, yeah. I mean, there, I don't know that there, there's not a whole lot of arguments for saying that yeah. that's, that's a yeah. better situation to go into that game. But to get back to Greg's question, in the long run, it could hurt them because the where the schedule seems to have an opening for both teams is during uh, the first week of April when the Blazers have a home game and then two days and then they're at Utah. So then you're looking at a potentially a back to back. Well, it definitely will be a back to back one way or the other, but maybe uh, a back to back featuring Minnesota and then and then Utah. Um, you know, with two weeks left in the season, Utah's a tough to place pl- to play already. So then you're sort of pushing one problem to the next. So in the here and now, I think it helps long term. I don't, I don't, I don't. I think it hurts them. You know, I, I mean, the the interesting thing is that they were already going to play the Timberwolves three times in the course of a month. So so kind of that doesn't change. Mm-hmm. You have Evan Turner back for you would assume that's true. That's for true. for the whenever the makeup game, assuming that the makeup game is going to be in that first week of April, where it looks like there's probably a date or two that might work there. So you get you get Evan back. But it's already pretty good against the Timberwolves, anyways. Um, I guess one thing at that point with the later you go, it might be easier if the Timberwolves look like they're already out of the race for that eighth spot. I mean, they're in it now. And who knows? Maybe the players won't be in it by the time that makeup game comes around. But the longer you extend that out, the more chance you have for maybe a Minnesota team that doesn't have as much to play for as they do two days ago. So, but I I, I, I do think it's mostly a push. Obviously, a team having to to board what ends up being roughly seven and a half to eight hours of two flights to play one game in Minneapolis is not great. Basically, it becomes a road trip. It becomes a two game trip. Because it of, if yeah. it's then with that Utah game, then it's basically a yeah. Game. I don't know if they're gonna if they're gonna pair it with that Utah game or if it's just gonna be a one off. Well, um, it, there's two days. If it's the time they're talking about, there's a, a home game, two days off, and then Utah. So if it's in there, it's essentially a two game trip, sure. one way or the other. Yeah, you're not gonna fly to Minnesota and back and then to Utah. And back. Yeah, true enough. But all that's speculating as to what day it might be yeah. anyway. So and the thing is, I mean, players when they get ready to play, they want to play. Yeah, you know, and and that and there is, I mean, to to Kevin and, and Lamar's point, there is something negative for getting yourself kind of in the mindset of I'm going to play a game tonight and then not playing. But again, I think that whatever whatever negatives you have in that regard are vastly outweighed by the positives of going up against a Thunder team, particularly with Russell Westbrook playing with his hair on fire, fully uh, fully rested. Boy, old Russ didn't have it late. He missed like no. That game was exactly three like quick, sh- really key shots all open, and then he missed that fourth three late. Exactly like like I, I thought it was almost the same exact performance as he put on here in Portland. And I think just a good encapsulation of who Russell Westbrook is as a, as a ball player right now, which is that he's he's very, very, very good. Late in games, taking jumpers. I don't think he's you know, he's the guy you want out there, but he's, he's and he's sure as hell not going to pass it to anyone in that situation. No. So, you know, you, you – and these are some of the complaints I think people have about Damian. And, I you know, I, I think that they're – you know, at least the logic of it is sound that – you know, when you put it all on yourself, particularly late in games, you you make it more difficult for yourself. And but it, but even with with Westbrook, they didn't throw doubles at him. You know, like they they just gave him a little bit of space, and he rose up and took two mid range shots that are they were good well, looks. I, they were good looks. I wouldn't. There certainly weren't bad shots, but they weren't great shots either. The three that he took wide open, wide open. But he's not that. He's like a thirty two percent three point shooter. He looked I a mean, little tired late too, and I'm sure he was. So you know, at a certain point, you gotta. You got to ride or die with your teammates, you know, like and and if you're saying, you know, the only way we can win this game is if I put it on my back. OK, but that's that's not a team, you know, like that's the point is to is to is to win as a team, not necessarily one guy carrying a bunch of other guys. And I think guys on that team would do more if they were given a bit more responsibility. But there's you're not you're not telling that guy anything right now. <laughs> OK, now we're going to enter uh, Yusuf Nurkic question territory. We've got five or six or so questions exclusively related to him. So let's just uh, knock them out one by one. Let's first from Jeremiah Wilson. How would you describe the well, he uses his Twitter handle. How would you describe Yusuf Nurkic in one word? Hmm. I think I would say fun. 
It looks like he's having fun. Uh, he's fun to watch. He has made the Blazers more fun to watch. Sure. Uh, as I talked about, the emotional boost he's given, that makes everything more fun. And just, again, he looks like he's he's having fun. So I'm going to go with fun. Yeah, jovial comes to mind. Um, one word, though. I'm trying to think of something that kind of reflects what he is meant to the team. Transformative is way too strong. Um, the Resurrector? <laughs> yeah, I'll just say jovial then. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have a couple... Uh, High on Nurkic hyperbole questions from mm. Michael VIP Lowry. Where does Nurkic rank in greatest centers in team history? One, Walton. Two, Sabonis. Three, Nurkic. Is there a statue being planned yet? And then from Brandon Goldner, is Nurkic the next Shaq or the next Akeem? All right, let's take these. Uh, no, one are by we, one. we don't really need to answer them. I think that they're. Well, but I will say this: the the question about where does Nurkic stack up in Trailblazer center lore, you know, I, someone mentioned it to me a couple of days ago, and and I had the same reaction initially, which was like, well, come on. But then when you really think about it, I mean, if for no other reason than just the lack of kind of a high quality center, you start to you start to put him right behind Sabonis in terms of at least like the last time they had a a center you felt really good about and from both sides of the ball you know i mean they they've had guys come and go they've had Joel Pritzbilla and Theo Ratliff and uh, i would definitely throw in Kevin Duckworth talking about Trailblazer centers i mean the guy did make an all-star team which <laughs> no blazer center in the next i don't know how long it's going to make an all-star team because Greg Oden's knees have since departed but i mean it's it, it's it's a weird topic to discuss seven games into a guy's career but when you really start kind of looking at the names and the options it starts to feel a little less weird no i take that back it still feels weird but it it, it feels a little more valid i guess yeah Let, let's, let's take the other ones let's answer these questions joe okay so give me the next are one you about. finally going to admit that you've caught the nurkic fever from randy powell uh no i wanted the other que- the, the, the hakeem question though that's what i was oh is nurkic the next shack or the next hakeem neither Okay. I just want to answer them, Joe. Oh, okay, my bad. Questions I want to answer. My bad. Uh, yeah, it's it's too early. I can't I can't go. Uh, I can't do this. And I think that they're mostly it's tongue in cheek here for sure. Uh, I've been very impressed with what I've seen. Uh, he's been a rejuvenator for for this team and his teammates. But it's been seven games. Even if it's still this way at the end of the year, I need to see it over the full course of a season, although I will be much more convinced if over the next 20 games it continues. So we'll see. There's going to be some some down times that we'll have to see them work through, and, and um, the, the, the league will scout him with this team, and we'll see how they adjust to that. But, uh, again, for all the reasons we've talked about, just the different dynamic that he provides, it's very, it's very interesting. Yeah, I agree. Um, from Tra... Obviously, Nurkic has been a revelation on the court. How has his chemistry been with the team off the court? It's been great. It's been very good. I think uh, Joe had mentioned that he really seems happy and excited to be here, and I, I think that you know when uh, when players see that, I think it it gives them cause to to want to to trust in him and to and to want to welcome him in. You know, I mean. And any time a guy's like, oh, man, I'm, I'm really glad I got traded here, you know, the team feels pretty good about that. Because there's some times when, you know, guys get traded and they probably aren't all that happy. Aaron Aflalo did not seem very happy to be here. No, he did not. I don't. He's a hard guy he's to read. He's a tough guy to pick. Yeah, yeah, but he did not seem happy to be here. No. Like from day one. The things, the things he said just didn't seem genuine when he arrived. But that's a whole another another time frame. Uh, both of our, our our colleagues, Jason Quick and Mike Richmond, have sort of in different ways written a little bit about this chemistry issue. Uh, Nurkic, in many ways, has has very quickly become close with Damian Lillard. It seems like um, they're kind of instantly making a connection. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, I know. CJ has worked with Nurkic, and Nurkic is really trying to get invested into the plays. I know um, before the last home game, which w- who was that against? The last home game was. Yeah, I'm spacing the, on. God, yeah, we were definitely at the point of the season where it I all not, blends I in. I cannot keep games. 
Oh, it was the Nets. It the was Nets. against the Nets. And uh, excuse us for that one. Yeah, yeah. Stotts uh, said that Nurkic knew like a third of the playbook or a half of the plays that they were currently running. And so he's got a lot of work to do. And I know Richmond had reported on, you know, at the last practice that they were going over, uh, he was going over sets on 5 uh, even more emphatically and, and trying to expand that playbook. And then teammates going up to him saying, no, you're doing this wrong. You got to go this way. So, uh, um, you know, it's pretty open right now. And a guy who's happy to be here with a team that's suddenly happy to have him. I mean, it's only natural for that chemistry to be good. Yeah. And Damien is just a guy, too, where like he is it's easy to he latches on to guys and, and really tries to make them feel like they're a part of it. You yeah. Know, like that. That's one of his that's one of his main, you know, personality traits in general, not just in basketball. Uh, next up from Justin, how many more wins do you think we would have if we made the trade for Nurkic at the start of the year? My guess is 10. That was his guess is 10. Hmm. An interesting question. Um, uh, let's assume that we're getting what we've, that we've, we, the Blazers are getting the production that we've seen over this seven games for the majority of the season. Okay. Because if that's the, that's the only that's thing the we have right to go right. off of. Okay. Ten's not a bad number. I mean, they would definitely have a winning record. I will say that. Because uh, for whatever reason, uh, well, we've talked about, I've talked about how I think his fits better than Mason Plumlee's ever was just because of the dimension he provides and the what he can do defensively as a big guy. Sure. Um, well, I mean, if you're just talking pure numbers, if you're adding 14.9 points, 8.1 rebounds, 4.0 assists, 1.3 blocks, and 1.6 steals per game, yeah. I, I I think eight to ten seems like a a reasonable number. Now, part of me is just a little reluctant to even kind of broach that because who knows, you know? And and, and when we kind of talked about earlier about kind of just the the feeling around this team right now, maybe that feeling isn't the way it feels. Right, it's it traded you know, at the beginning of the season, you know, like that. Maybe that that kind of release or however what do you want to call it like maybe that's that doesn't happen and it's more like this team is just stumbling along but it's got use of Nurkic good point yeah instead of Mason Plumlee so you know because I do feel like part of it is just the the feel around this team right now you know and I don't know if I could put a percentage on how much of that is is why they're playing better or at least why they look like they're playing better or having more fun (laughs) but you know it, it is not insignificant so let me say this Nurkic's uh, replacement of Plumlee does not negate Al Farouk Aminu's season of injuries. Correct. It does not uh, negate Evan Turner's sluggish start and then his injury. It doesn't take away Ed Davis's shoulder situation. Absolutely. doesn't take away Damian Lillard's ankle injury. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of things that still would be the same even if that change had been made. So... Um, I will say – I will adjust my thing to con- – I'll say a five-game swing at least. Yeah, ten, 10 seems to me like a little it's, high. That's high. That's uh, high. 10 – because if you're, if you're talking about adding a guy to your team for <clears throat> 10 wins, like that's that's all-star caliber, you know, and mm-hmm. and I think Yusuf has been great. But, yeah, again, let's – I don't want to get too crazy here. But, I mean, he's – one thing you don't need to debate is they've been much better with him on the floor. In the last seven games. Next up from Stephen Reed, how much credit can we give Neil Olshay for Nurkic's success? Do you think they anticipated the impact he's having? Love the pod. Well, thanks for listening, Thank Stephen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he gets credit for making the he trade. Made the trade, and yeah. So, for getting a I mean, pick in the process. Um, so he gets all the credit in the world for that. I pretty much can guarantee they didn't anticipate getting this much from him. I, I would agree. One thing I will say, though, is... Neil deserves credit as he has throughout his tenure in Portland of looking at other teams, seeing guys that have fallen out of favor for perhaps non basketball reasons, and then going and getting those guys at an absolute bargain. And I mean, he did it with Mo, did it with Robin Lopez, Robin Lopez has done it with Nurkic. I mean, like, and that's not nothing, you know, like that's a, that's a big thing to do. And that, and that, I mean, evidently it's a talent. And whether it's scouting acumen, whether it's being able to read a situation at another franchise and and know kind of where what the situation is to where you feel like your situation is different enough to where you can get a better 
a better result from that player, if it's knowing other teams well enough and having relationships with other front office guys to know kind of where they're willing to to concede, whatever it is, he's done a very good job of it. And, I mean, like, you can hate on Neil all you want, but the fact is, I mean, like, that's that's at least one thing that he's shown he is very good at. And when you look at where this franchise is and what I think us and the majority of fans have come to grips with is that it's going to be very hard to lure a, a premier free agent here for whatever reason. Yes. And so well, for, for a number of reasons. Well, right. Yeah. So the ways that you're going to be able to accentuate this roster and make it better are obvious. You're going to need to make a trade. You're going to need to draft shrewdly. So those are the tools that he has at his disposal. And he capitalized on that trade as he we've seen him do in the past for Robin Lopez for, uh, I mean, the Aaron LaFlalo trade didn't work out. Uh, he's made trade on draft nights that worked out. And Mason Plumlee was a trade that he acquired, which was good for a year and a half. Um, it's kind of funny. The center just keeps getting passed yeah. along. You got Rolo for two years. You got Mason. Now you've got Nurkic. And I think that's something that if you're if if you're one of the Nurkic break pumpers, I think that's a fair thing to say is like, look, we've been here before and, you know, we still don't have that figured out just yet. Now, granted, I, I do think that Nurkic could be the guy, but will the Blazers be in a situation financially two years from now? to be able to sign Nurkic where they couldn't do that with Plumlee, and that was one of the main reasons why they traded him. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, next up from Dave Myers, are you guys looking forward to Nurkic versus Draymond as much as I am? Mortal Kombat. Hashtag Mortal Kombat. I guess he's he's talking about the playoffs. He's yeah. Dave, no, Dave's already got the Blazers nah, in the playoffs. I'm not doing that yet. All uh, right. Sorry, Dave. Case well, and, and just to, to answer your question, I don't... I mean, like, I, I, I don't think that... Nurkic is necessarily taking any crap, but I don't. He's not like a Draymond style troll, so I don't. Yeah. I don't know that I. I'd really look to that at this point. Next up from Tyler Stobe. I, I, I sorry, it could be Stobie. I apologize, Tyler. Um, You're trying, Joe. I am. Uh, question number one: What's more valuable to this team, a first round playoff exit or a top five pick? Uh, and question two: Can Nurkic be a legit option number three? I can answer these very quickly in my own opinion. Yeah. Uh, for question one, I think a top five pick is way more important than a first round exit. Top five is no joke. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a Nurkic, from what we've seen so far, can be a legit number three option. Uh, not only from his scoring ability down low, but his a passing ability too. It makes him uh, a legit key in this cog. Is that a phrase? Well, or is that I guess not metaphors? A, yeah, he'd need to be a cog in the machine. There it is. Yeah. Thank you. He'd be a key cog in this machine yes uh, uh, yeah I think he can be a legit option three let's just say that. yeah absolutely because I think your third option doesn't have to be a guy who's scoring 20 points a night I think I, if Nurkic can ever like 15 yeah absolutely I don't uh, even remember what the first part of that question was now. it was the do, would you rather have a top five pick or oh, a first round right. exit <clears throat> you know I, I think that I think it's again whatever you feel like is more important I think is valid Okay, the, answer, next. the answer is to, is in everyone's heart. <laughs> there, there is there are however many fans there are of the Trailblazers. There are that many different answers to that question. Okay, from Corbina Smith, did you guys see Hail Caesar? If so, did you like it? Yeah, no, I already I, I took this uh, conversation online with uh, with Corbin, who's it's his birthday today, by the way. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Corbin. Corbin. Um, no, everyone kept dogging it. Uh, Reviews wise, but it's Cohen Brothers, so it can't be that bad. And what he said is that it's it's good. It's got a couple slow parts, but it's good. So, so. I when I saw the first trailer for this movie, I really wanted to see it. It looked great. Um, and then like like you said, it got universally panned, yeah, ev crushed by everyone. And so. Well, oftentimes that doesn't factor into whether or not I watch a movie. It did in this case, and so I haven't seen it. But because of your rec, Corbin, I will take the time to watch it because it's out well, on HBO. It's on right HBO, now. exactly. Yeah. And it's one. I mean, and for me, if a m movie is even halfway decent and it's free, it's like you should probably watch it. Yeah, why not? Yeah, uh, I would watch it tonight. But we're going to my wife and I are going to the uh, Kenton Neighborhood Association meeting today. Oh, nice! If you live in Kenton, uh, we'll show up. There. They're going to let you. They're going to let us vote on stuff. I can uh, change the subject back to movies. I saw Logan yesterday. Oh, what you think? It's excellent. Yeah, very. Uh, it's it's dark and it's real violent. Very violent. Um, Do but I, it was it was fantastic. Would I have need to have seen the other X Men movies to understand it? I didn't watch any of the Wolverine movies, and I've probably seen two or three X Men movies. I say no. I say you just go watch it. Hmm. 
It's uh it's not a over the top uh superhero sure. crazy movie. It's more of like you remember how when uh is it Daniel Craig took over for Bond? Mm-hmm. Is that his name? And it got real raw and real dark that first sure. Yeah, like it's kind of like that. Yeah. Casino Royale. Yeah. Okay. Casino yeah. So I thought it was great. I would wreck it to anybody. I'll definitely I'll I'll I predict I will watch that on a plane sometime in the next two months. There you go. Uh next up from Pods Podstalgic Peter. Can you describe each player with a movie title? Ooh, that's a good question. Hey, right into the movies. You know what? We, uh, I think this. Uh, let's hold this question for another pod. We'll put some thought yeah, into we it. Should, we should. We should actually give it some. Yeah. some discussion. That's, uh, that's a great question, though. We'll. I'll hold on to that, uh, Peter. I promise. Um, next up from Jared Cowley. Hey guys, not including any Blazers. Who is your favorite player and coach in the NBA, and why? Hmm. Mm, good question. I could tell you my favorite coach would be Steve Kerr uh, for multiple reasons. Number one, he treats the media with respect and uh, he treats you like a human, which is all I ever ask for from a coach. He seems like a human and a coach that I would want to play for, like a a genuinely good guy that you would want to be around um, and that you would want to play hard for. So for those... I, I think those are two good reasons without expounding too much, but uh, he would be at the top of my list. Yeah, I like, a, obviously, I think Steve Kerr is up there. I I mean, I don't know that I would love to play for him, but just as someone who who is obviously covering the league and watching it, I, I think Stan Van Gundy is great. Um, I think he's honest. Um, I think he's a pretty good coach. Uh, he, he's He says what he feels about his players and – about anything. About anything, really, absolutely. So uh, as far as players go, I the other part of that question, too, is is that like players I like personally or players that I think are great players because... So I think what we do on the players is we don't know all of these players personally. So let's just say like a player whose game you respect or a game whose game you admire, who from what you know about him seems to be a guy that you would want to root for. Sure. And and I know, you know, as for Blazers fans, why are you rooting for other uh, guys? But I, I think it's a good it's a good question. Like who just take it from who whose game do you respect? And, and who I've always you? liked Paul George. Um, he seems like an, a nice young man. Uh, the Laker fandom notwithstanding. I saw him snap his leg in half live. So I've always kind of oh. had a soft spot for him after that. Uh, and he seems like a good guy. I've talked to him a couple of times at Team USA practice. He's always very uh, yeah. He seems like very a willing to uh, to engage, which is which is nice, especially for a player of that caliber. Um, taking it on a personal level, uh, since he's going to be here tomorrow night, Sergio Rodriguez. Oh, one, one of my, my favorites. One of my all time favorite dudes. Period. Um, had a real fun talk with him when we were in Philadelphia. I uh, never did get to see him when we were in Philly. Yeah. Well, and he's going to be here tomorrow night, and I'm sure that uh, or he's going to be here tonight. Actually, I'm sure that. Some of Sergio's old haunts, perhaps we'll uh, we'll get a visit. We'll get a visit. So, um, those what are, those about? Uh, I like Kawhi Leonard. I like Kawhi he's Leonard a fan- too. Fantastic he's just a player. little too quiet for me. No, like, he's, he mean, would be he, a brutal he, cover. As, a, as a player. Uh, he's he'd be he's brutal, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you got to give me a little little something more to root for you on, and on a personal level. Uh, I also really like Anthony Davis's game. I mean, he's a guy. It, I when do. He's not I hurt. I, Anthony Davis has uh, kind of the 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 other side of that. I've. I've only had a couple interactions with Anthony Davis, but they've all been kind of negative. Huh. So interesting. Yeah, I haven't had any interaction with him, so I couldn't say. I mean, and not like super, not like awful or anything, but just just a little little terse. Okay, you know. Um, I also Demar Derozan. I've had good interactions with, and I I like his game too. He, he's he's on the list. Not probably not at the top of the list, but on the list. Um, that. I can, I can never pronounce his name, but Jonas from Milwaukee, he's a heck of a player. Oh, yeah. Jonas um, Antetokounmpo. Yeah. Antetokounmpo. Yeah, I'm not even going to try. Um, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not that bad, really. You just got to get it get it a few times, and yeah. I'm just not going to try. Um, I don't know. Those are a couple players that are on the top of my list. I mean, obviously, y- you respect the hell out of LeBron James and, and Kevin Durant and guys like that. Uh, Usually the guys who are the absolute best of the best tend not to be my favorite players because uh, you sort of end up taking them for granted. At and some and level. to be perfectly honest, and just with my personality, I tend to root against players more than I probably root for other players. Sure. So, and I'm not getting into those guys, but I like I Jimmy Butler, I like Jimmy Butler. He's a too. dog. Yeah, he's a dog. Uh, 
Yeah, and you know his his, his backstory is is rather impressive as well, going from from being homeless in high school to you know it's pretty to where is that now? That's that's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's. We should probably hit the accelerator here on yeah, some of these questions. Snap <clears throat> them out here. Okay. Uh, Harrison Sam wants to know on a scale of one to ten, how confident are we that the Blazers will make the playoffs? I'm a I'm a six. I was gonna say five. Yeah, five. Ryan McCullough wants to know how will you celebrate Portland winning the championship this year? With a whole lot of work. <laughs> we won't need to be celebrating that, Casey. Yeah, Ryan is is mostly just joking. I will backtrack to one question. I did tell my wife before the game last night that if they beat Oklahoma City and Oklahoma City, that they were going to make the playoffs. Yeah. So I guess preparing I should, her for the worst. I guess I should have uh, upped that. Yeah, she's my wife is definitely one of those people who's on the fence about the team making the playoffs, but not for the. Of reasons. Reasons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, three questions here about Evan Turner. I'll ask them boom, 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 and we'll answer boom, boom, boom. Uh, from Dayton Brown, how do you think Evan Turner will be rotated in once he returns? Dustin Hawes wants to know how does the team incorporate Evan Turner when all signs show a shorter rotation is working, and what does it mean for Boz? Uh, Levi Laz wants to know is this team better without Evan Turner? I say we generally talk about these without necessarily. Sure. Yeah. Uh, no, they're not better without Evan Turner. Uh, I think they're better with Yusuf Nurkic. That's what you're seeing right now. Not so much the team playing better without Evan Turner. Uh, how do they integrate him back in? I think they probably give him a game or two off the bench, and then I think they probably put him back in the starting lineup. Um, Shabazz is out Shabazz of the rotation. Shabazz is probably going to lose his minutes, which is, is kind of a shame. I'd like to figure out some way to keep him in there because I do think he's he's, earned he's really been giving them some good spot minutes. But he had a big shot in that fourth quarter last night. Huge shot. And, I mean, he had a, he had a big shot uh, – in the last game against Oklahoma City, actually, I, I was doing my research. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Shabazz took one shot. It was a three-pointer, and he made it in the yeah. fourth quarter without Damian. So that was that was huge as well. Shabazz, I mean, he's he, he every time he plays, it looks like he should be playing minutes. you know. And I, but I just don't – I have a hard time seeing how he's going to get that when Turner comes back. We'll see. Maybe they'll figure it out. I think uh, it depends on where the team is at right when Evan returns. If the team is still doing what it's doing now and they're just crushing and – you know, they're on a hot streak. You don't mess with that. You're not going to put Evan back in the starting lineup because it's going to throw everything out of whack. Uh, if they're still kind of middling and they're up and down or down, I think you put him back in the starting lineup as he was. So I think it's a little too early to tell. We'll have to decide when he gets back how that will be handled. And we're still uh, probably about five games away from that, I think. So yeah. ish. And five-ish. that's a good point, too. Where, where they're at, I do think we'll, we'll have a play in, yeah. in how he's, he's utilized. Okay, next up from Blueberry Joe, what's the best case... T- for next year look like oh we can't talk about next year yet blueberry joe we still have so much more time this uh this season so next up from eduardo ortega question for the pod who should the blazers want to draft what position should they draft what players should they draft what athlete oh yeah yeah we'll talk about this this summer eduardo and we will do lots of talking because they have three first round picks thanks for the question and and not to blow off your question eduardo too but i just don't know right now so that that's that's, yeah that's why i can't answer we talked about this uh a little bit on our last pod um we're going to hold off on that, and we just we haven't researched the draft that much exactly. yet. We're we're in the nitty gritty now. Uh, Jackson wants to know, Casey, what does post haste mean? Quickly, yeah, with immediacy, yeah. essentially. Uh, next up from Rip City Revival, who would win in a one on one game between the two of you? My money is on Casey. I already let this uh, this person know. Thank you for listening, by the way. That uh. Joe would easily beat me in a game on one-on-one. Give me all of your money. Yeah. Uh, Sam K wants to know, can we go over the cap to sign Nurkic to an extension? If so, will we do so before he goes into restricted free agent after next season? We're seven games into his career here, Sam. I know everybody loves him, rightfully so, but we can't get carried away. To answer your first question, yes. First of all, they already are over the cap. Uh, second of all, you can sign your players to go at any point, no matter where you are at the cap, if they're your player, you can sign them to whatever you want. As for when they do and when they will do it and if they will do it, we'll have to wait and see how this plays out a little longer. Yeah, they're still they're still a little ways away from, from setting that price. How is, uh, from Alex PDX, how is the team talking about their playoff push? Hopefully, or excuse me, hopeful or confident, do they consider themselves playoff bound? Well, I guess we kind of talked about that a little uh, bit. Yeah, right? I don't... I think the playoffs are their goal. I don't know that they consider themselves playoff bound. I think they know that and and have stated as much that they're behind the eight ball right now and they have not put themselves in a very good position. And if it's going to happen, they're going to have to to really 
play better and, and string together more wins than they have yet this season. So I, I think they're hopeful, but I don't know if I would say they're confident. confident. Yep. Yeah. Uh, next up from Mitchell Duncombe, if the starting five blaze. If the Blazers' starting five were a PDX food truck slash restaurant, which are they and why? Oh, another good question. Let's let's put this one with the movie. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll put some thought into that, and I'll I'll prom- I promise we'll we'll remember this uh, for down the road, Mitchell, and we'll answer your questions. Good. I can't one. say I went to the uh, the brick and mortar of Gabagool that used to be a cart pasta. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. St. John's. On okay. Lombard. Check it out. Nice. Uh, nice spot. You can tell. Once uh once they get it built out all the way, they got a nice big patio. It's gonna be a good spot. All right, um and then finally from Ronnie Stewart, I'm probably too late. Oh no, you're not too late, Ronnie. I got it just before we uh, started the podcast. Uh, why does Mo Harkless keep his mouth guard in his sock while he's shooting free throws? That's actually kind of common for players. I agree. I don't. I don't know exactly why the sock is the place to go. I mean, I guess because you it's it's kind of locked in, um and I guess. I mean, your legs are sweaty, obviously, but I guess you just kind of get over that fact. Well, I, pure, it's your body, I guess. So in that regard, too, it's like it's my sweat. So what's the difference? Pure speculation of why they remove it from their mouths is it's a distraction when they're yeah. shooting free throws. Well, guys don't necessarily like to wear mouth guards, but yeah. if it's between wearing a mouth guard and getting your teeth busted out and or getting concussions, you're much more likely to have a concussion without a mouth guard. Um, guys are willing to wear them, but I don't think they necessarily like wearing no. them. No. Um, I, I think Mo particularly doesn't. I, I think Mo's looks kind of big, too. I don't know. And there's also, there's like four guys on this team that has Invisaligns right now, too. So. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening, yeah. uh, y'all. <laughs> we'll end on that note. Uh, we should be back next week. We're going to be on the road, aren't we? Yeah, no, the, we'll the podcast try to, is hitting the road again. Yeah, we'll yeah. do a road podcast somewhere. Um, maybe in Atlanta? First day off in Atlanta? There's no... Uh, a couple days off in Atlanta, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, doing a, uh, an Atlanta podcast. Uh, my uh, sisters are going to come up and visit me. Hey. Yeah, maybe, they live in uh, Tallahassee, Florida, and they're going to make the drive up to say hi. We're going to be there for three days. Yeah, oh, we're going to be there for That's a while. It's going to be fun so. to see them. going to get to see my nieces because they're on spring break, too, awesome. so I get to see them. Wow, this is this is really shaping up. Yeah. Uh, usually, you wouldn't want to spend two off days in Atlanta instead of, say, New Orleans or Miami, but well, I'm all right I with mean, it. The only thing I can think of about that trip is the end is near. from Miami to Portland after a 7.30 start time. I mean that's like an well that's like an eight hour flight. Is it a seven thirty start time? I, I think no, like I think Miami's? it's a it's a Sunday game. Oh, is it a Sunday game? Yeah, it's oh, a Sunday well, game. It's it's mind. a six I'm, o'clock start time. I'm gonna change my uh, turn this frown upside down. Yeah. All right. Uh, again, he's Casey Holdall. I'm Joe Freeman. Thanks as always for listening. If you like us, give us a review on iTunes uh, to give us some love. Uh, we will talk to you again next week. Take care. What he do for the sport? Damon Stoudemire saves the day, aka Mighty Mouse. Gonna show all of you scrubs how to play. What a show! Why the Lakers even wanted with us? You know, no one's ready to deal with us.